All of the cards from Innistrad Crimson Vow have been fully spoiled. So now, it's time to turn our attention to the biggest, the meatiest, the moneyest cards from Crimson Vow. Magic. I am a wizard! History. I'm an old wizard! The Magic Historian. My bones hurt. Greetings! Owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles, my friends, I hope the day finds you well. We have gathered to discuss the top 15 most valuable cards from Innistrad Crimson Val. Now there's a couple of pieces of information you're going to need ahead of time to understand this video. First, all the prices in this video are based on pre-release pricing, so if you see this video after it's been put out, these prices may have changed. And I'm using Canadian prices because I'm Canadian. The second point that you need to know is every card on this list are going to be regular printings. We're not going to include the borderless planeswalkers. We're not going to include the extended bordered set booster cards or anything like these box toppers. All of that stuff is off to the side. We're going to be using regular versions. But since we're on that note, I will let you know that this Count Dracula box topper right here is far and away the most valuable card in the set. It's worth more than twice any of the cards we're going to talk about on the list. Now, let us start out with number 15, which is Cemetery Desecrator. Now, this guy is currently starting out at $7 pre-release price, and it is six mana for a 4-4 four, four with Menace that has a number of useful applications. You can use it to get rid of your opponent's Planeswalkers, you can use it to get rid of plus one, plus one counters on their guys, or negative counters from your own guys, and you can also use it to remove creatures from the game. Not from the game, sorry, from the battlefield, right? You can give them minus X, minus X, which is useful for creatures that have indestructible like Toski and stuff like that. So I have to admit, I'm kind of not happy to see him because I know this guy right here is going to end up messing up some of my Toskis. Not too shabby a card. Artwork depicts pretty standardized zombie kind of hanging out. What's up, buddy? You want to come on into the cemetery? I'm, I'm here to desecrate it. It's like, all right, bro, let's do it. Moving on to the next card, number 14. We've got the Savior of All in Bach. And I will admit that I didn't actually fully understand the card when it first came out. So, Savior of All in Bach, $8, two white and one for a 1 2 human soldier. This guy has the ability to exile your opponent's creatures from the battle. I mean, you could do your own creatures from the battlefield too. Your opponent's creatures from the battlefield, but I never noticed first time around that it also hits cards from the graveyard. So you can basically exile your own creatures from the graveyard, and then when the savior of Allenbach goes, you can bring it all back. So this can be used to get your opponent's creatures out of the way. It can be used to protect your creatures that are currently on board from some wipe that's gonna happen, or it can be used to bring stuff back from your graveyard. So overall, this guy is really solid. The artwork, though, still does look to me like a weird Street Fighter cosplay. You know what I mean? I'm from Street Fighter. And the lady in the back, goes, I'm a vampire who apparently wants to stop you. That, that vampire is like, please wait. That's the kind of vibe it gives. Anyways, that's number 14. Number 13 is a double-sided card. So this is Volatile Arsonist. Volatile Arsonist is coming in at $9.00. Two red and three for a four four with menace and haste. Whenever it attacks, it deals one damage to each uh, of up to one target creature, one target player, and one target planeswalker. So you can get a lot of value out of this just going bing, 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 bing. The artwork's pretty intense too. It looks like somebody who's been burned by their own torch and almost half blinded, making their way in the darkness, just whipping torches at people. But once you flip it over, whoo, oh, dire strain anarchist. Menace Haste 5-5, five, five. and whenever it attacks, it deals two damage to up to three different targets like that. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. This is a solid card, and I love how on the one side, you got a torch. On this side, you got a whole tree set on fire. Not too shabby. So, what's coming in at number 12? We've got Henrika Domnathi. Two black and two, one three flyer that lets you choose three different things. You can either make everybody sack a creature, you get to draw a card and lose a life, or you transform her. But you can only do each one time. I do like the fact that if you really want the other side of her, you can flip it right away. I mean, the artwork's pretty good. She's floating there. She's got a glass of blood. She's drinking it up. Next up is the other side, Henrika Infernal Seer. 3-4 Flying Death Touch Lifelink. So, I mean, this is significant. And it's got the ability to pump 
all your creatures that have flying, death touch, or lifelink. Not too shabby. Flavor text is fun. Once you've tasted demon blood, you'll wonder why you ever settled for human. And that actually 100% feels legit to me. It's like, whoa, 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 demon blood is right up there. Why am I drinking this human stuff? Get it out of here. So, Henrika's the last one we have at $9. The next one is $10, and that is Hollowed Haunting. Two white and two gets you an enchantment that as long as you have seven or more enchantments out, your creatures have flying and vigilance. That part is a little bit whoop de doo who cares, but the part down here that says whenever you cast an enchantment, make a white spirit cleric that has power and toughness equal to the number of spirits you have, that's respectable. Time will tell whether this one's going to head upwards or downwards, because bear in mind, this is all pre-release prices and pre-release guessery, right? It's not too shabby a card, but it may not be... This is one where I'm like, mm, could go either way. Next up, we've got one I'm a huge fan of. Moving into the $12 category, we've got Toxrill the Corrosive. I don't know what it is about the word Toxrill, but it makes me think of like a brand of beef bouillon. But I wouldn't want no bouillon from this thing. So Toxrill is seven mana for a 7-7 seven, seven that slimes all your opponent's creatures. And for each time they get slimed, they got a minus one, minus one. And then uh, whenever a creature your opponent has gets taken down and has slime counters on it, like when it dies, you get a 1-1 one, one slug. So it's either like the ooze, the slime is transmogrifying them into slugs, or Toxril sludge slime has like eggs in it and they just kind of burrow into your flesh and eat you. I don't know, man. Pretty intense. And then they tapped on the whole sack of slug draw card ability. Also changes the color identity, which I guess makes some people unhappy. But this is a really cool card. You got a legendary slug of doom. You know, like, pretty solid. That's pretty good. Number 10 on the list. Moving on, who do we got at number 9? We've got Olivia the Crimson Bride. She is also 12 bones. 12 a dollar in dues. One red, one black, and four. Three, four, flyer with haste. And whenever she swings, you get to bring a creature back from your graveyard, also swinging, and you get to keep those creatures as long as you control a legendary vampire. So she's a legendary vamp legendary vampire, but if you have out Edgar or any other legendary vampire, you still get to keep these resurrected, these vampirized corpses. That's actually a pretty intense concept, you know? pretty nutty overall seems like a solid card right i mean you can swing in with it with haste right away feels like you can get some good value off it and depending on what you bring back from your graveyard could be pretty crazy i'll bring tox roll back from my graveyard get slimed so yeah i mean the artwork's pretty nuts look at all the look at what looks like her hair and blood like it's like flowing in this crazy braid behind her pretty wild indeed now, what is number eight, you ask? Number eight is Faith Bound Judge, who's also coming in at 12. So, two white and one, four, four, flying defender vigilance. On this side, he's basically just chilling out going, yo, I can't swing until we wait a few turns. I gotta wait, I got a pizza pocket in the oven, I gotta wait for it to heat up. All these swords coming up in the air, it's like, yeah, they're all vibrating and heating up. And then it flips over to the other side and he jams you full of the swords when he judges you to be a sinner. You're a sinner! You stopped the microwave with my pizza pocket in it. Feel my doom! So it turns into an enchantment that goes on a player and then three turns after the enchantment comes out, that player just straight up loses the game. That's a pretty intense enchantment. Like this is a very fun, like straight in your face, big effect that I really like. That's sort of like, hey, guess what? Clock's ticking, buddy, tick tock, your life is running out. It's got that like, if you ever played the old Final Fantasy games where they had that doom and they play doom on you and then there's a counter above your head that just counts down, it gives you that sort of like frenetic, I gotta do something vibe. I like it, it's really cool. And I love the fact that the swords are shown in the first artwork and then like flying around the judge and then they're just driving in to that as who has been judged. Take that, demon! All right, so what do we have next? Number seven is the Cemetery Prowler. This is one I wouldn't be surprised to see moving up the rank. So, Cemetery Prowler coming in at 13. Nice unlucky number for Innistrad. Two green and one gets you three, four vigilance. When it enters the battlefield or swings, you exile the creature. And then it reduces your spell costs for every type that it shares with. So every, basically, he removes creatures, boom, makes your creatures cheaper. Remove artifact, make artifacts cheaper. It's pretty nice acceleration in a cheap little mana package, right? Like this 
is a genuinely solid card. He just kind of looks like a faithful little dog, but he's got a bunch of skulls hanging out of his mouth. I'm going to eat these up and somehow let you put your creatures out cheaper. It's like, I don't know how you do it, Mr. Wolf, but I love it. What am I going to say? Like, this guy, four of them. Four of them into my green tower, absolutely guaranteed. Now, let us move on to number six. Number six is Necro Duality. One blue and three for an enchantment that doubles your zombies. But it doesn't double token zombies that you make. It doubles non-token zombies that you make. Which is a very interesting effect because a lot of doubling style effects specifically care about tokens and go, yo, let's make two tokens. But not this one. This goes, oh, you're making a regular zombie? Here. Have a bonus token copy of it, which feels a lot more powerful because tokens mostly tend to be weaker, right? Not always, but tokens usually tend to be weaker. Oh, I got a 1-1 one, one with tickle or something. You know, it's like, whoa, you get 20 tickle counters, you cry. You know, it's like, eh, okay, you make another one of those, no big deal. But you can, with this, you can put out like Cemetery Prowler or whatever and be like, yo, I get an extra one. It's like, what? Yeah, I just get an extra Cemetery Prowler. It's like, uh, not Cemetery Prowler, sorry. Cemetery Desecrator. They all have Cemetery in the name. It all gets, like, muddled up. You try dealing with tons of magic cards day in and day out when Wizards makes them all have similar names and stuff, and you try keeping it straight, okay? I'm just trying to keep my sanity here, all right? Stop judging me. So Necro Duality is uh, 15 bones, all right? And not too, not too surprising. This is one that over time feels like it's going to climb the ranks and people are going to want it more. Moving on, we've got one of the most exciting cards in Innistrad, for me at least. Avabrock Caretaker, also at $15. The front side, 6 mana, 4-4 four, four, Hexproof. Every single turn at the beginning of combat, you get to put 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on one of your creatures. Not her though, for some reason, I don't know. So take a look at her nice white dress, and then when we flip over to the other side, this artwork actually is really idyllic and beautiful. I really, really enjoy it, and I love the contrast to the other side. The other side, you can see, look, her dress is ripping away, and every time I'm like, how much money does this lady spend on dresses? You had all day to take the dress off, lady. You had all day. Now it's night, and it just got ripped off. Wait a minute. Okay, you know what? Let's not dwell on, let's not dwell on any of this stuff. Let's just move on. Let's talk about the card. So, 6-6 six, six, Hexproof. Other permanents you control have Hexproof. At the beginning of combat on your turn, put two plus one plus one counters on each creature you control. It's like, it's so mind-blowing. This side of the card just makes me go, what? Like, it's so crazy. All of your creatures get plus two plus two, and all of your creatures have Hexproof. This guy and your other ones. It's nuts. It's so good. This feels crazy to me. This is another one that I will definitely play with four of. You know, like, it's so just so good moving on to number four we've got chandra dressed to kill coming in at 16 i honestly don't like the way that the fire is obscuring part of the name of the card i don't like that and chandra your shoulders got a lot broader didn't they man i saw the other artwork for chandra dressed to kill she looks great in that gown and everything that's great artwork I don't like this one. I'm going to admit I don't like the artwork. But the card itself is really solid. Let's be real. Three mana for a three loyalty Planeswalker. The first ability allows you to like either get rid of Planeswalkers, slow their Planeswalkers down. It speeds up your mana. Or you can just pink your opponent. She's got two acceleration loyalty abilities. So the second one allows you to exile the top card of your library. If it's red, you can cast it this turn. So she can give you mana. She can give you card draw. She can help suppress planeswalkers slam your opponent and then her ultimate is also really strong too where you exile the top five cards of your library and you can cast red spells from among them along with getting an emblem that says whenever you cast a red spell do x damage where x is how much it costs to play it like that's crazy it's crazy you just bam 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 you can just slam it's it feels really solid for three mana honestly the only thing i don't like about this card is the artwork. Chandra doesn't look great here to me. It's, it's a personal taste thing, so whatever. Take it for what it is. She's number four. Let's move on to number three. Moopy old Soren. Look at me. I'm mopey and moopy, and the ladies love my broody nature and open shirt. Hello, ladies. Maybe you can defrost my heart and make me smile. I'm so edgy and dark inside. I'm very emo. And he, <laughs> there's just something about this Soren that irks me, man. You know, they had him in the story 
And in the story, like the first half of the story, he was just kind of there, Edgar, like at the Markov Man and just being like a broody crybaby. And that's just the, I just think of him as like a recalcitrant child now, which really doesn't fit the vibe of Soren because Soren is like thousands of years old and he's supposed to be like some kind of bon vivant who's experienced so much in life that he's just kind of like, I've had so much pleasure that it's almost meaningless to me. And then you have him like, I have no mirth. Oh, you marry my grandpa. I don't like it. I don't like what's going on. No, you can't have the moon silver key. My parents won't buy me a Lambo. Like, I don't know, man. There's just He just seems like a mopey kid. But, you know what, let's turn to the card itself and what it does. Two black and two get you four loyalty planeswalker. The first ability allows you to feed more cards into your hand while cranked up as loyalty. Yes, it costs you life, but who cares? We all know that life is just another resource to be exploited. Oh, that just sounded... I just sound like the head of corn. <laughs> when I'm like, life is to be exploited. It's a resource to be exploited. It's like, shouldn't I be heading up some gigantic corporation? Crush them! Take their dollars and make them live in the gutters! <laughs> Anyways, in magic, life is definitely a resource, right? So, minus two ability. Create a two, three black vampire creature token with flying and lifelink. And the ultimate... Deal 13 damage to any target, you gain 13 life. Now, the ultimate doesn't really have the same pop in terms of an emblem going on and on, but presumably, 13 damage to any target and you gaining 13 life should be enough to seal up any game, right? So you can use the first ability to fill your hand. The second ability gives you a chump blocker that also can um, function to give you additional life to get the life back that you lost from the first ability. And then you can just ultimate smash it with this gigantic, life-draining, vampiric feeling ability. It feels overall really solid, right? This is a solid card, and I don't believe I've said the price, so right now Soren the Mirthless is a $20 card. The Dracula version that I showed you at the beginning of the video is a $60 card. So that is the top tier. Obviously, with the way Wizards has done things with all these different editions and stuff, it's changed somewhat the way the market works. And in some cases, you can find foils that are cheaper than the regular versions, which blows my mind. And that's part of the reason I just like to use regular versions for these videos, because it gets too confusing. It could just be like extended, borderless, all this other craziness, right? Anyhow, let's move on to number two, which number two and number one are actually tied in value, so you can put them in either order. So I've got number two as Maniform Hellkite, although it could easily be number one. This is a very, very strong card, right? It's only four mana, so it's two red and two. You get a four, four flying dragon, right off of the bat and it being a dragon does matter because there are cards that specifically care about you having dragons cards that will let you speed dragons out or search for them like there are a number of things that care about tribal dragonosity and that's obviously accented by I mean four mana for a four four flying dragon if you just have that you're looking at a whatever uncommon but when you add this ability on whenever you cast a non-creature spell create an xx red dragon illusion creature token with flying in haste where X is the amount of mana spent to cast that spell, exile that token at the beginning of the next end step. It actually kind of shares design space, in a way, with Chandra's ability, right? Like, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you're getting, a like, a, um, a token that you can swing with. Now, Chandra does care specifically about it being red spells, but this is very similar to whenever you cast a non-creature spell, deal X damage where X is its casting cost to your opponent, assuming they don't have a way to stop the tokens you're swinging with because they're all just one shots so as long as you can swing clearly through in the air because they have flying in haste then it's going to be the same as if the ability just said do damage to your opponent although you know you do have to jump through the hope hoop of actually being able to uh, swing with it the artwork on this is awesome i love these dragons with their kind of like gossamer wings that the the moonlight shines through it's not as good as the other dragon that we saw with the stained glass wings but not too shabby so this is 22 dollars, and then the number one card is cultivator colossus also at 22 this thing has c combo nonsense written all over it outside of standard inside of standard i'm not sure exactly but outside of standard you can do some really crazy stuff with 
toughness. On the surface, it's seven mana for a star star trampler. It's power and toughness are each equal to the number of lands you control. But where it really becomes crazy is its enter the battlefield ability, where it says you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield tapped if you do draw a card and repeat this process. So if you can cheat this guy onto the board super early and you have a bunch of lands in your hand, you can just play those lands and draw cards. And even if you draw lands from those cards, you can play those as well. So you can ideally cycle through a ton of different cards with this and get a lot of card advantage very quickly. And the fact that he lets you slap the lands out actually makes him beefy fast. Like if you will put him out and you only have two lands out, but you have like four lands in your hand and you play all four of those lands and draw another land off the top of your deck, you get to play that one too. All of a sudden you have seven lands. So you only you only use two mana to get him out and you got him out rapidly. But all of a sudden he's this huge hulking beast with trample that will keep growing as you get more and more lands out, right? So it really does feel like a crazy combo beast. Anyhow, that wraps up the top 15 most valuable cards. Big thank you to all my patrons. On the screen, I'm going to have the playlist of my Innistrad Crimson Vow spoiler videos in case you haven't seen them and you want to hear me go more in depth because all the cards that are in this video are covered in those videos, but more in depth as well. Talking about the artwork, the flavor, the cards overall, all that good stuff. And I'll leave a link to Innistrad lore on the screen as well. Thanks for coming by, my friends. See you next time.